Hello and welcome to this week's Webinar Wednesday e-learning series. My name is Lars Peterson. The topic I'm going to be covering today is master models. First thing is to define a master model. What is it? Simply it's a part that's going to define the geometry of an assembly. So if you're dealing with a consumer product or something where you have a limited amount of space, you can design the entire shape that you want your system to be and then break that shape up into the different components putting the detail in the components and then you can reassemble those parts and the assembly looks just like you want it to. There's a couple reasons for this. It's, it's a lot easier than trying to build parts bottom up where you're building the pieces and then assembling them to get them in that perfect shape without having some sort of um, master part that's going to define the shape of the assembly. Also you can make changes to geometry and the parts will update. Um, if you leave external references in, I could make this thing longer and then all the pieces like the handle and the front would become longer as well. So the master model, it gives me one point of reference to make any changes and it also allows you to get whatever cool shape you want and make sure that the, all your parts fit into that cool shape. So I need a design to do. I'm going to take this little flexible shark toy and this dolphin submarine kind of combine the two inside SOLIDWORKS I've simply modeled up a very simple shark body you want to try and keep your master model simple don't put too much detail into it you want to put the detail into the parts if you are having it resolve it's it's gonna um, have trouble if you have to rebuild and you're having errors inside of the part that's driving everything else. But if you keep the upper level part simple, it's much easier to make changes downstream. So I didn't design too much, even these uh, fins, you know, they're just planar surfaces. I also just kept it as a surface design. I didn't bother making it a solid. It doesn't necessarily have to be a solid body. It doesn't have to be a surface body either, but you can go either way or have a combination of both for your master models. Another thing that's nice to put into a master model for work on downstream is you can put in reference planes or axes. I've done some split lines here just so I can get a spot where I'm going to have different colors on the sections of this body automatically. So that's my master model. How do I go from doing that to getting it into an assembly? One way of transferring the geometry from the master model into the component model is by using the insert part command. When you do this you can insert the entire component and you can actually choose the entities within the component whether you want to bring in the surface models or the saw models or any reference geometry you can do it when you insert the part. You can also choose to change the location of the origin automatically when you uh, bring the part in and also there's a choice when you're using this insert part as to whether you want to continue having that context if you want to force it to look at the master model to update or whether you want to break that connection you can do that using this insert part within SOLIDWORKS. So here I have this master model that I'd like to use again in another part. I'm going to start a new part and choose insert part. When I do that, it sends me to a browser to search for the master model. I'm going to pick the shark here. And if I back up, I can see that it's going to, in fact, bring in that model. Whether I want to bring in the surface bodies or solid bodies, like I said, you can choose here, axes or planes, and you can even bring in unabsorbed sketches, which are sketches just sitting out in space, or absorbed sketches from the features inside this part. You can actually bring those across if you want to reference them uh, in this component. There's a locate part with move copy feature. With this checked on it'll automatically allow you to change the location of this. When I just hit the green check mark it drops it origin on origin so the original master model origin will be the same as this new components origin. If I want to change that I can check this locate move copy. The break link you'll notice when I turn that on it grays out all these choices up here in the property manager. And the reason that is, is that when you choose to break the link, it actually is going to bring in the component as an editable type of component inside of this part, instead of having to look back to that external reference. 
So let me show you what I mean. When I press the green check mark again, it'll put origin on origin. It automatically puts me into the move copy body, and this will move the entire part as a unit, whether it's surface or solid body, it doesn't really matter. I can translate this component along X, Y, and Z coordinates to move it, um, or I can rotate it as well. You can rotate it about a, an origin, about the origin, or around a particular uh, point in space you can even use to rotate about that. So you can use translate or rotate. Unfortunately, um, you can't use them both. You can't move and rotate the component in one move copy body. You have to do that in two separate move copy bodies. You can also use the constraints here. If you have geometry inside of, an, of the component, you can mate that to this in this location. Like if I wanted to mate the edge of this part to the front plane, I could do that. And it's much like mating inside of an assembly. Um, you may want to not always do that because there is an advantage to having all of the origins at the same place when you are creating this stuff um, in contacts with the master model. But if you do want to move the origin for whatever reason, you can do that by checking on that component on insertion. When you do that, you get this move copy body already put into your component. That's what this feature is from. I asked it to bring in the planes, so I can reference those planes along the original uh, part geometry and any other geometry inside here. You'll notice that it does not have an external reference. When I chose to break the link with the part, I've actually got sketches in here now that I can edit in the context of this component. And that's not going to go back to the original master model. Any changes done at the component level are just going to happen inside of this component. So that's what those two check marks mean at the bottom of the insert part. I'm actually going to create another part. You can also put the insert part. It is a, it's a feature, so I put it on my feature toolbar if you use it a lot you can put it up there on your customized toolbar. When I drop this one in I don't want to break the link with the part and I'm not going to bother with locating the part location. I just hit the check mark and it drops the part right in there. You can see that my feature manager tree for this component looks a lot different where before I had sketches that I could reference here and I could actually make changes to the geometry like these split lines but I can't do it when you do keep the link with the part. If you see that external reference, that's going to be there because every time this part opens, it's going to want to reference that original geometry. If it can't find the original geometry to reference, it will um, hold its last saved shape. So it's not going to just error out on you because it can't resolve the geometry. It's just going to leave it like the last time it saw it. When you do have this external reference, it does um, slow down assemblies when you open them up, so you do want to be aware of that, whether you want to break that link or not. When you do use the break link, of course, you're sort of divorced from the master model. It's going to look exactly like the master model when it was dropped in, but it's not going to have that link with it where it updates. So it's a sort of a decision you have to make at the insert part when you first do it. Do I want to make changes from the master model, or do I want to force them to make changes at the master model? Because at this point, I can't make that change to the canopy like I was making in the other component. If I want to make changes, I have to right click in the component and say edit component, and it'll take me back to the parent. It'll take me back to that shark where it got the original shape. So now that I've got the body in there, I want to start basically stealing geometry off of it. Um, I'm going to start a sketch on this reference plane that came with the model and I'll use a tool called an intersection curve. If you use an intersection curve without being inside a sketch you can pick where two faces intersect or two surfaces intersect and it'll give you a 3D sketch where that geometry intersects. If you are inside of a 2D sketch it'll actually only pick the uh, the surface or whatever you've selected where it crosses the sketch plane you're in. I'm going to take a look at the side. 
say, okay, I want to know where this face and this face cross that sketch. When you do it, it takes that geometry from that original shark shape and puts it into this sketch. If I wanted to do an offset, I can use these offset entities. You didn't used to be able to do this in older versions of SOLIDWORKS, being able to um, offset a spline that's been grabbed from some other location, but uh, SOLIDWORKS is pretty forgiving these days. So you can offset these types of captured splines from these this geometry. You also have the choice right away to make the base construction if you want to ignore the, the edge from it. So you can use the original surfaces that I showed you and then use that offset um, to make sure that you're inside of the envelope of the original part. Another way that uh, people like to do this type of design is to just use an offset surface so that they are sure that any of the stuff that they grab on to is going to be to the inside or to the outside of the component. So I'm going to go to the inside here, and I've got these two surface bodies right now. It's a good idea to start getting into, you know, switching between surface bodies and, and solid bodies when you are doing this type of design. One trick is to pick the bodies you're after and just choose isolate, so you're only looking at the solids or surfaces you're concerned with. I'm going to uh, start a sketch on this plane and again do an intersection curve where those faces intersect with the part. I can see that it actually doesn't even intersect that plane. So I'm going to create another plane just to the inside. sketch on there and then try that trick again with the two offset surfaces. There we go. Clean that up, get the sketch so it doesn't actually cross it. Now I know that that's going to fit inside of that original shark body because it was a, an offset from the surface of that. So just a couple of ways of grabbing information. You can also do convert entities and all sorts of other things just to steal geometry from that shape to put it into this shape. What I'm doing uh, right now is I'm going to start building a weldment here. Um, weldments are nice multi-body types of components. We've got a webinar on it which you can check out. But what, what is nice is I can quickly fill this up with structural numbers like pipes or tubes or things like that. But one stipulation for the weldment is it has to be um, arcs. I can't do any splines. So I'm going to change this, um, you know, trace over this spline here with some arc geometry. this. All right. All right. There we go. So just about trace that sketch that I want and I'll go into the weldment toolbar. So I want to do some structural member and start populating this new sketch with some geometry. It's not going to let me do the, uh, the copied sketch but I can do the sketches that have the arc. So well, let me do the sketch with the splines. Now if I hide these surface bodies, you can see I've got a pipe in there. So if we flash forward this, I've actually done this whole weldment for the cockpit and I built this using that master model. That was the first thing that I put into here and if we show the solid bodies, you can see that it fits perfectly inside it. How I'm doing this uh, sort of wireframe solid body, if you've ever seen this uh, display pane 
tab right here I can pick surfaces and I can choose to make them shaded which wouldn't allow me to see much inside those surfaces or you can also do um, you know make things transparent or wireframe or change how they're shown graphically so that it gives you an idea of where the surfaces are. Also a nice thing about surface bodies is you can just go to the surface body folder hide all of them at once if you just want to concentrate on the real components and not this master model sort of phantom overlay. Another way to transfer the geometry from the master model to the dependent child part is by using a trick where you start from the master model, you pick a body, and you choose to insert that body into a new part. You can bring either surfaces or solids or a combination of the two. It's not as robust as the insert part in the way it doesn't let you move things or break the relationship with it. It's always going to be externally referenced to the master model and it's always going to be automatically placed with the origin of the original master model the same as the origin on the new part. Only bodies are allowed also. In the insert part we had the ability to bring across sketches and reference geometry. When you do it in this way it's only going to bring the body across. Let's go into SolidWorks and I'm going to choose which bodies I'd like to bring across. I just want to make the fiberglass nose for this thing so I'm just going to bring in that much of the model. I choose the bodies that I'm after, right click and choose insert into new part. When I do this it's going to ask me for um, a name of the part. Also depending on the settings that you have it may also ask you for the template for that part. Okay so it's brought in this new part um, I can you know um, start sketches on here converting geometry from those surfaces that I've brought over as well as um, you know I can see these surfaces again if I right click and choose edit in context if it's able to find the master model it will open it up so I'm forced to make changes from the master model I can't really make changes to the geometry from this location but I can use that geometry certainly um, to create new geometry. So I'm going to fit spline here, start a new sketch, convert this geometry. So you, again you can steal geometry from that master model to start fleshing out this component. I'm going to boundary surface from here to here. Say that I want it to be normal to the original profile. Also, this imported geometry, of course, if it's planar, you can do things like you can use it as a mirror tool. I want to mirror about that. Mirror this body. Hide things, use my surfacing tools, start fleshing out this. Again, you want to have the just the basics in your master model, and you can flesh out um, the rest of the geometry in the component pieces. So I've just uh, inserted uh, some planar surfaces on the ends of it to cap the ends. Use these surfaces that I created, knit, and turn those into a solid. Again take a look my origin is way back here this is the original origin of the part so I have all the way back to the tail there for where my um, origin is and it didn't bring across those reference planes like I had in my original part but I'm just gonna bring a plane about that far And again, you can use geometry from that imported geometry that you've used 
from your insert part. I just want to find out where the intersections are for that. Turn it into a surface. off this nose here. Do a little more surface work so you can see that I'm actually working with the surfaces that I brought in directly from the other model. And again, if you've got knit solid, you can try to thicken it create a solid from that. If I have merge results on here, got both the bodies showing, they blend into one body and now I can do fillets and things like that. So quickly start developing a part directly from the surfaces just shot out from that master model. A third way of bringing the master model geometry into a dependent model is using something called a split feature. This tool allows you to take a component and break it down into individual components and actually save them out as SLD PRT files, so they're independent SOLIDWORKS part files based on this model directly. Um, you can also quickly, after you've made changes to the individual components, you can reassemble these into an assembly very easily using this tool. So let me go into SOLIDWORKS and show you how this works. Go. I've got this cabin here which I started developing uh, from that insert component choice. So these are all, you know, if I wanted to make changes I'd have to edit in context and take me back to the shark. But I'm going to make this become a master model for the outside of the cabin. I have already developed it with multi-bodies in mind where I've split parts up and made cuts and developed things as multi-bodies already. If you want to do bodies on the fly, you can also use the split part to do that. If I want to create like an access door here on the side, I just need to bring that geometry up and I can use this geometry when I do create that split feature to break this face off of the door. However, if I do use split feature, it's actually going to go in both directions. So if you want a split to only happen in one particular area, it's better to use the surface as the cutting tool. Let me demonstrate what I mean here. I'm going to do the same type of thing over here where I'm going to create some uh, gills. Maybe some doors here for venting, shape them like gills. Keep that shark theme going. And of course, Shark has three gills, so make a quick sketch pattern. Alright, so I've got a surface and a sketch that I want to use with this split part. If I go to Insert Features Split, it'll ask me what, uh, you know, templates I want to use for any parts or assemblies that are created from this split. And it automatically found all of the multi-bodies that I built into the part. If I want to make more bodies, I can choose cutting tools, like here I'm going to use this surface or this sketch, and when I choose to cut the part, it's going to take it from the original eight bodies um, to many more. Go to the next ten, look how many I've got. Like 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 bodies now because it actually broke those doors out for the gill and this bay here. And when you hover over it, you can see which bodies you're dealing with when you pick these call outs. You can double click um, on any of those bodies and choose to give it a name.
If you see a check mark here, it's actually going to create an SLD PRT. If there's no check mark, it will still break it into multibodies, but it's not going to create that external file for you. There's a nice tool here that showed up a couple years ago, auto assign names. If you don't want to sit there and type all the, uh, the file names in by hand, you can just leave them as body32 or something like that and maybe use um, SOLIDWORKS Explorer later to, to change the names or if you have a PDM you can use that to change the names as well and keep those external references linked. Anyhow, when I hit the green check mark, this is going to take a while because what it's doing right now is it's actually opening up 15 blank parts and it's creating SLD part files for every, every single body that was inside of that split feature. So once it's finished this up, like I said, I got to wait for 15 of them to go here. They're actually open inside of RAM. So when it's done, I can go to the Windows cascade all these and see all the parts at once. It does take a little while. It's going to take longer the more bodies that you have. I actually had 33 it looks like it. A whole lot of bodies. So once it's done with that I can go into these individual part files and see they've got an external reference back to the, the master model, back to that cabin but they're their own file. Now I can start making changes on this part file and it'll have a, uh, a single reference point for all of those files um, that it created. Okay, when you do create a split part, it is a feature inside your feature manager tree, so you can suppress it and unsuppress it between configurations and things like that. Um, you can also right-click on it and edit it if you want to change any of the information that was in there, add more split bodies or, or uh, change names, things like that. If you do change the names, it is going to create a whole other SLD PRT file for you. You can also right-click on that split part and choose to create an assembly automatically. And what that does is you can browse and give the assembly a name. When you do that and hit the green check mark, it's going to take all those components that the split part made and it's going to reassemble them into an assembly automatically using that same um, Split uh, that same origin that you had from the master model. So if I zoom back here, you can see that it's reassembled these with their new names like canopy and body, what have you, um, and it's put them all together. Now you can unfix these if you'd like. If you want the canopy and some of these other components to move, you can right-click on them and choose to float, and now they will move. Um, automatically by themselves. And you can mate them together and you can break that link with the original um, uh, positioning inside of the model where now I can break it into an assembly and I can get um, dynamic motion and things like that. If I want to see how this canopy is going to open and close, I can do that where it's not so easy inside of just the uh, part file. I floated all of these. In. Uh, see now this can move. Um, if I want to lock them together, here's a neat trick inside an assembly. I can go to my mate tool. So I can do multiple mate on a lock mate. You can do multiple mate. You can say I want this to be the main part and then add as many components that you want locked in that same position to it. And then when I go to move this, now you see that the whole canopy moves as a unit, where that would be a little bit more difficult inside of a part file. And I can build a hinge and that sort of thing in here using that shape that I had from the original. You can also use master models at the assembly level and use them as a top-down design from the assembly environment 
It's a good idea to have the master model, if you are going to use a lot of master models, to have the master model inside the assembly anyhow. A lot of people like to put in the part file and then maybe suppress it so it doesn't show up inside of the bill of materials or as a consideration for mass properties when you're looking at weight. But I prefer to use a tool called the envelope. It's kind of a forgotten tool because it originally was for doing searches inside of an assembly and it's been outdated by some other search tools that we have available. Um, but it is a nice thing because when you drop an envelope into an assembly, it doesn't show up in the bill of materials, it doesn't show up in the mass properties, and it's automatically transparent. So it does a lot of that stuff that you don't want your master model to show up as in your assembly, but it's still a good idea to have it in the assembly so that when you do rebuilds, you don't ever have the part missing and the rebuilds aren't occurring like they should. Um, it also just loads that memory into RAM automatically, and when you do pack and go and things like that, you can see it on a list of things. Uh, when you do want to ship those things around so you don't lose the master model when you're moving the assembly around. Okay, back to SOLIDWORKS to talk a little bit about this envelope tool. So if you've never used it, it's under Insert Envelope. I'm going to create a new one at this point. You can use an existing from file, and I'm going to do that in a second. I'm going to create a new one. It forces me to create a, an external file. And then I actually build it like I would build a component. Draw out a circle, and extrude it. After I've done that, you see it puts this envelope into my feature manager tree. And when I get out of the edit component, I've got this part here that's not going to show up in my bill of materials. It's not going to show up in the mass properties. At my configuration manager, I can go in and I can use this envelope tool as a search tool. I can right click and say show hide using envelope and I can choose to show parts that are completely inside or to the outside of the envelope or anything that's crossing it. So if I just want things that are completely inside of that envelope I can hide the rest and you'll see it just shows me areas inside that volume. So it's a search tool, and the reason that I say that it's kind of outdated is, um, actually let me cancel that hide, just do a quick undo, and then I'll delete this envelope just as if it was a part. It's in 2010, I was given the ability, if I press my S key, I can do a volume select. If I pre-select a face before I do that, choose to do a volume select. It's sort of like I've opened a sketch on that face. And if I do the crossing box from the left to the right, it's anything that's inside that shape. And if I do it from the right to the left, just like when you're doing a uh, selection box inside of a sketch, everything that touches it will be from that direction. So I just want stuff that's inside this box. And I can give it a, a Z component. And you'll see that it selects everything in my uh, feature manager tree that's inside of that volume. I can right click and do that isolate that I showed you earlier at the body level. You can do an isolate at the part level and it'll just show me the things that are inside of that box. When I exit isolate it'll show me the things again. You do have the choice to quickly save this display state which is an improvement over the old um, envelope way where the envelope you had to quickly undo it or run the test again and say show everything on the outside of the envelope. So this is kind of nice because nice I can create a display state instantly, exit out of the isolate, and then at the display state level I can go back to what I had searched for, what I had selected inside of that volume select. You can also insert an envelope from a file. I'm going to start a new assembly here and instead of inserting a part like you usually would with an assembly I'm going to insert an envelope from file and search for that master model. Like I said this is a good idea because it's going to put um, that master model into the assembly level where it's always going to be loaded into RAM whenever I open up this assembly so I don't have to worry about losing the rebuild connection with it 
um, with the components that are inside the assembly. Okay, picked, the, uh, picked an assembly there and it wouldn't let me do it, but when you pick a part file, it lets you do it. So you basically can drop this part into the assembly. It, it's just like when you um, drop a component into assembly. If you move the cursor over the origin, the origin of the part and the origin of the assembly will snap together. And I get this envelope that is a component. I mean, I can get in here and I can edit any of this sketch geometry as long as I save the assembly. So let's save this assembly too. It's a beautiful name. And then I can go in and I can start making changes if I need to right within the assembly. So I've got this component at the assembly. I have uh, access to all of the features inside of it. But again, it does not show up as anything with any weight. And if I put a bill of materials into it, it won't be accounted for. I also like to do this um, envelope because it's a nice overview of where the original part was. When I start inserting components into this assembly, let's try the weldment. Drop that in there. How about that cabin subassembly that I built? And drop that in there. And that knows. So I can quickly start populating this thing and see what I've got built in comparison to that master model. The envelope can be hidden or shown. Like I said, it automatically shows up transparent. It also is not accounted for in the bill of materials. If I were to insert a bill into this assembly, which you can do at the assembly level, I just want to see the parts in there. When it shows me a list of the parts, I've got all those parts inside of that canopy that I dropped in there. But you're seeing that I don't have anything called envelope one. This is just the weldment, the nose, and the pieces of the um, cabin. Or I could even change how this is and do an indented list. So you can start seeing all the weldment pieces that I need, the quantity of tubing and all that sort of thing. So it's nice that uh, I can still bring up a very detailed um, bill of materials, but not have to worry about whether or not the envelope um, is going to be showing up inside of that bill. Yet another way to have a master model that you can work on is you can also bring in an existing assembly and ship it out as a model. When you do that, you can build parts around this and maybe shoot those bodies that you've created inside the multi-body part out using one of those tools like the insert into new part that I showed you earlier. Let's take a look at this example and see why you might want to do that. First off, I want to have a jet drive just like this one only I wish it was twice as big there is no um, scale feature there's no assembly feature that's called scale I can really just do cuts and things like that patterns but I can't scale this whole body and that's one of the things that I'd like to do so first off I'm going to hide anything that I'm not actually gonna bring here or not hide it but um, physically suppress it so that if it's something I don't want in there, it's not going to come across. So I'll suppress any of these bodies that I don't want to see. And then I can do a file, save as, and switch it to a part file. When you do that, you get three choices. I can save it as exterior faces. If I do that, it's just going to be surfaces that shows me the extents of the model. I can do exterior components. If I do that, 
if I sent out a refrigerator, it would just be the legs and the door and the body of it. It wouldn't send all the racks. All the internal parts would be um, suppressed. If I do all components, it's going to ship all components out as multi-bodies. So let's go ahead and do that. Choose what type of template you want. It takes a little time. But once it's finished, I'm going to have an exterior file that's an SLD PRT with all of that assembly information in there. So here's that jet drive. As a part file, you can see it's come across as multiple bodies. I'm not going to be able to change the geometry on this. It's going to be now converted into dumb solids. It's not going to have any link with that original. But sometimes this is a good way uh, to bring in parts, or sometimes you'll get parts like this because you've imported an STL file or a STEP file or something like that, where it comes in as multi-bodies rather than as an assembly. I can design inside of this assembly area. Let's take care of that scale. I wanted to insert feature scale. So I can pick body by body or I can just select these things out of the solid body uh, folder in my feature manager tree. You don't want to make sure that this is set to origins. If you just have it set to centroid, what it does is it scales about the center of every model. And so it's not in where they're in orientation to one another. It just keeps them in space and makes them bigger. Um, that's because originally this scale tool was used for people that did molds, and they wanted to know where the centroid of the mass was. So when it cooled down, uh, you could account for shrink. We're just wanting to scale this thing about the same um, orientation everything was to one another and so we use the origin as the reference point for it to scale and you'll see rather than scaling all the parts and leaving them in space they move and it's just two times bigger um, as measured from the origin. So that was the first reason I wanted to save it as a part just so I could scale it and like I said sometimes you have no choice if you're sent an export file um, that isn't a SOLIDWORKS file, it's already multi-bodies, you can still develop parts, like I want to develop the outside um, a shell, basically, it's going to fit on the end of that shark. I can snap to existing geometry, I can put in measurements, dimension tool. I'm going to give this thing a length and then I should have it all fully defined. There we go. Now when I say that I want to revolve it, I'm not going to close it because I want it to be a thin walled feature. I also want to turn off this merge results. And that will allow me to keep this as another body. And I can continue making changes. If I just want to work on this body, I showed you earlier, you can use that isolate tool. And now any features that I do, um, any sketch based features like extrudes or cuts or things like that, are only going to affect this um, particular body. They're not going to affect any of the hidden bodies while I'm working in that isolate mode. So even though I'm going to do a through all in both directions here, when I exit out of the isolate, you'll see that it did not cut the drive shaft in there. So I'm going to toggle back to that assembly that I had. That's the assembly I was after. And I'm going to insert that jet drive component. And again, I can um, use information like the, uh, the axis that I brought in from the original as something to mate about. Or if 
faces on the edges or whatever I want to do to get this thing placed into the model. So you can start taking a look at how it's going to fit into the model. And I can use a lot of different um, tools now that I've showed you earlier on how to change the size or um, how to change how this model is going to react with the rest of the part. So I can make changes on its own and then go back into the assembly and see how that fits on to that master model. Okay, like I showed you, you can right click and insert this body into its own part if you want to create another component that you can make detailed drawings and things like that of. But you actually don't really need to do all that much stuff now in 2012 as we're getting into SolidWorks. There's a lot of multi-body tricks that in just the past few years have come about. The ability to um, edit materials at the body level, to get a cut list, to, to do an exploded view is what you can do in 2012. So a lot of different tricks that you can use so you don't even really need to make it um, its own component. Like if I wanted to make a drawing of this assembly and have exploded views and call out this detail, I can do that without making an assembly. Um, inside of the part, I can say let's do an exploded view, insert exploded view. Like I said, this is something new in 2012 because I am actually inside of a part file. I'm not inside an assembly file. The interface is very similar where I can move it part by part. If I want it to go along a certain edge, I can change that edge, start exploding components out of here, and those will be stored in the configuration where I can um, collapse and explode them just like I would inside of an assembly. When it comes to making the drawing, just save this here, and then I'll say make a new drawing. When I go to make a drawing view, I have the exploded view right here. Do a shaded of that. Always makes it a little more clear. I can also, when I create a model view, and I choose to make something of that jet drive part, rather than switching configuration, I can choose selected bodies and I can say I'd just like to make a drawing view of that body. And when I do this, start making my uh, different views, things like that, I can make them just as if they were their own part file. I can put dimensions on here to let people know how big things are supposed to be and just um, you know, separate that body from the rest of the model in its own drawing view without having to create a part file. I can just make drawing views of a body. Also, if I go back uh, into that assembly, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm starting to get confused as to what it is. It is a part file, it's not an assembly, even though I've got exploded views. And if I go into this part file and I choose the weldment tool, and insert a weldment tool, it changes my multi-body folder into a cut list. And if I update that, what it does is it allows me to group, it'll find any like bodies and group them so that I get a quantity of two. It's, it interrogates the volumes and if they're the same it'll just group them into the same cut list item. Also, um, at the body level, as I had mentioned earlier, I can go to a particular body and I can change the material. If I want this one to be made out of plastic um, and have the rest of it, you know, have the default body made out of steel, I can start getting an idea of what the weight of this item is with, again, not having to go into an assembly. I can assign the materials at the multi-body level. Also, when you do this cut list, if I go into the properties here, you can see that it gives me a cut table that has lengths, 
built into it because that's what it was originally made for. But this gives me a quantity and an item number. And I can go into the properties of any of these and add different uh, things. Like if I want to have a description of a body, I can do that and bring that into that cut list just like it's a bill of materials item. So just like you can put a property to a model and have it brought out in the bill of materials at the assembly level, you can put a property into a cut list item and have it put in to that cut list at the drawing level. So if I insert um, the cut list now, let me make sure I've saved this. It's always a good idea to save it so that it will refresh everything. Pick this, insert, table, weldment cut list. I can drop in a cut list here and you'll see it has that description. I have this thing set to material. You can change this to use any type of cut list property or um, any other um, properties you know that you put into that cut list. Also having that cut list in there allows me to um, put in balloons for this drawing view. And you'll see another nice addition to balloons with uh, 2012 is these magnet lines. If I want to have things along a line here so they're sort of hugging the shape of the assembly, I can do that as well. So a lot of nice tools inside of 2010, 2011, 2012 as they've been developing these multi-bodies where you don't really always have to go back into the assembly level um, to get the information that you want on a detailed drawing. Okay, well that was uh, the meat of what I wanted to show you in this webinar Wednesday. Thank you.